Hi, everybody. I am Jennifer Davis. I am a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft, and I'm here to talk to you about the ops and serverless. So just before I really dig into this, uh, a key point I want to highlight is that I am speaking from my personal experience. This is not to tell you, here are the features of Microsoft Azure. Um, we have a booth out in the lobby, and you're more than welcome to come out and talk to us about that. I am going to focus on my, my story. So once upon a time, a long time ago, I was introduced to the joy of text-based adventure games. Now, there was this one game called Transylvania. Uh, I loved this game because it was interesting, uh, fantasy-oriented. It had werewolves and vampires. Now, there weren't any instructions on how you actually play the game. You're given a goal, and you have to figure out how to get there. And so it was really great when I managed to figure out how to defeat the werewolf. So like how you play, in case you've never played a text-based adventure game, is you have um, a little prompt and you have options. So you could go like north, east, west, south, whatever is available to you. And there's objects. So there's like a stump in front of you. You're dropped into this world and there's a stump and it has writing on it and you can't decipher it. So you can do things like look at stump or read stump. And of course, it's not going to let you read because it's indecipherable. And so you have to figure out how to play. You can collect some objects, like you can't pick up the stump, but there's other things that you are able to use objects upon other objects. So I would get super excited about solving a particular puzzle, but then I'd get frustrated when I couldn't get past a particular problem. And one of those problems was the vampire. And I recently read through the walkthrough, and it was like, ah, I would have never have figured this out. Now, I tried so many different parameters that just aired out. And that's because the game designer didn't think about how I was going to use this particular software. And many people were probably very frustrated by this. Also, I couldn't figure out what the game designer thought. I mean, I would never have thought to sing a song uh, to get some help from a magical wizard. Like, who would have thought that was a choice? And what that means, like when I look at how we design software, I feel like a lot of the software we design is implemented in the same way. We're just like, yes, it works. It works, you can just do this, but we're not telling people what it's supposed to do. We give this like abstract goal, like you can use this for websites. Um, but we're not telling people and informing them. We're not giving them the joy of discovery. We're, we're like getting in their way. And, uh, I loved the talk this morning, the keynote, about accidental complexity and essential complexity. Our systems are going to be complex. But we're accidentally creating these horrible experiences for people, and then it's reflected, like our design is reflected in their experience. When I think about operations, so much of what we do, um, it, it's challenging and interesting because of these problems. We're the people who are the glue for so much. We think about what are the gaps, and we find the information that's needed to solve the problems that we have. There's so much information logging coming in, and then we have to figure out what's not essential, like not getting overwhelmed by all this information. And so what we do is prioritize, prioritize our work based on the information we're getting. And I think I should have had an inkling that I would love operations because of this, these text-based adventure games, because I love digging into how something works. Even without all the guidance to tell me exactly what to do, I love figuring this shit out. Um, it's like, what is the software developer trying to achieve, how they define it, Look at the documentation, does that match? And then look at it in practice. What are people actually experiencing? And those three things can be vastly different and create this conflict of unhappy users, right? And that's kind of why I do advocacy now, because I want to help improve that across this whole spectrum. How do I solve this problem? So let's dig into serverless. And specifically, let's talk about functions as a service. And there's a set of values that sort of describe what people mean when they're talking about functions as a service. So 
no server provisioning, scales automatically, no idling costs, and increased availability. Now, I read this out loud intentionally because nowhere in there did you hear me say no ops. And yet, so often, that's what people focus on. There's no more operations needed. But it's not true. In fact, these values are so broad that the implementation details across services are vastly different. And so I think many people are struggling to identify and understand what it is that we're doing and how we get there and implement it in a reliable way. Another part of the problem is, if I think about the software lifecycle and I think about all these different phases of what software has to um, go through, so much of the information out there is focused on development, ignoring all of these other pieces. So it feels like people are out there randomly trying north, east, south, west, trying to navigate where they're going to build reliable systems. So it might sound like I'm saying, don't use serverless. And that's not the case at all. There are really good use cases for a serverless. For example, web applications where you have high volume, a high volume of transactions that are occurring for like static websites where you just want to isolate it from parts of your infrastructure um, and just have it scale automatically, great use case. Data processing where you don't want to spend uh, money on services, servers um, or instances 24 by 7 for applications you're running once a day or once a week or once a month. That matters. You, you, don't, you don't need to spend that money. A additionally, a lot of ops use cases of where we have dedicated systems running, uh, we don't need them. We can use serverless to do chatbots and IT automation so that we can run scripts that are scheduled. For example, if I want to check um, whether I have my configuration management software configured correctly, running on systems, so maybe somebody's disabled it. I can audit my systems regularly to make sure that there is no orphan notes. And that means that I can address that one vulnerability where configuration drift is one of the leading causes of failures. So if I think about it, the perceived benefits versus the actual benefits, we talk about oh, you get the simplified operational model, and you pay for the use with serverless. But what I perceive is that we get this additional choice. If I look at this diagram and I think about on-prem hardware, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and functions as a service, I'm basically saying, as I go up the stack, I'm decreasing my operational burden. There's specific elements that I no longer have to worry about and care about, and as an ops person, that's fantastic. I was so happy when I didn't have to go into the data center anymore and plug in cables and rack and stack. Yay. But as I go up the stack and reduce my operational burden, I also am increasing the complexity of my operations to understand what's going on in the system. So I can be strategic about exactly what I'm spending money on as I go up the stack and therefore reduce my cost, but only if I'm increasing my visibility. So let's actually dig into discovery. Now, I don't have enough time in a 15-minute talk, or less than 15 minutes without a break. Um, I'm going to focus first on discovery and just talk a little bit about maybe give a pathway to increased understanding so you're not just walking through the forest trying out different paths. So a key aspect of something you need to do when you're first planning and designing your applications in serverless is governance. Now, everyone, every application needs to care about governance, but it is especially critical with serverless because at the beginning, you need to decide how is it that you're programming your application and who has access to what resources. With serverless, you can deploy it really quickly, and so that means you can have impacts really quickly. You don't want to create root-like access that has the, uh, the ability and possibility to completely torch your entire uh, environment. Another important thing is function rot. If you're not looking at the, how your functions are get, getting created um, without any oversight, to those functions, you're not saving money 
if these particular functions are just always running. If they're executing, but they're not having a value add, that's a problem. It was amazing to me to find this was like a common thing to happen. We want to be able to leverage the cloud capabilities and enable our engineers to, to build value, right? We want that, so we give them this access. But the impact can have various impacts on other functions running. Every service uh, provider that provides functions has some amount of limits, some particular limit, and you may skirt those limits with functions that you don't even realize are running, especially when you let people build functions from like consoles, right? They're building them, putting them in the portal, not using version control or continuous integration and deployment to actually be able to see this. So much like crufty code, tests, and monitoring alerts, we have to maintain and delete functions that aren't in use. So one example of a framework that we could use is the serverless framework. And it's so awesome because you can actually embed your uh, infrastructure in terms of the identity components of authorization and uh, uh, authentication and authorization along with the code of the functions themselves. So we're actually doing DevOps, right? We have our devs and our ops working right together in the code. So like serverless is awesome for DevOps. We also can have our security folks be able to audit and see what permissions are enabled for these functions. So I've talked a little, about, a little bit about some of the considerations from this discovery phase. Let's zoom on over to monitoring. If I think about compute-based tools, we have a fair number of things that we get automatically, things that we're used to monitoring. CPU, memory, disk utilization, they tell stories to us, especially from a context of across time. So much of what we gain from our monitoring systems and uh, uh, like observing um, our environments, we get from these system metrics. But what happens when we no longer have a server to monitor these metrics? Let me tell you a little bit of a story. My introduction to serverless was through debugging an application uh, at a company that I worked at prior to Microsoft. And we use AWS for this. And this is a stub functions uh, application. And so people were telling me it's randomly failing, uh, and then it all of a sudden completely continuously failed. And so like, when I opened it up, I was like, oh, this is so cool. I get a visualization of everything, and I can see exactly where the problem is, kind of. Like, it's green, 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 and then yellow. That isn't very helpful. And so CloudWatch gives you these metrics uh, automatically of the duration, how long the function ran for each of these, the invocations, how often it's um, calling the function, the errors, maybe like timeouts or memory concerns, other limitations. Um, other limitations that might come up, and then also throttles, like how often have we reached limits? So this, as you can tell, probably isn't helpful in debugging specific problems. What happens is we have to think about how do we plan for observability and instrumentation. So it goes back to our design. We have to, at the beginning, think about how we are planning our um, serverless functions so that, we can so that we can see into the code and make decisions based on that. So I want us to come together and start talking about operability concerns of serverless. Rather than saying it's not useful, let's talk through these particular aspects. We have such an opportunity to help other people not have this horrible experience of just like, let's try anything that sticks. As an advocate, I am really excited about the opportunity to help all of us shape this operability of serverless in general. Uh, you've seen my Twitter account here at the bottom, hopefully, at SIGJE. You can also email me at serverless at awesomedevops.com. I, e I will email to the Usenix folks these slides, and there will be additional resources to learn from, uh, as well as I will tweet this out. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share this with you.